very much, and thank you for inviting me. Thank you to the fair and inviting us to come. And we try to get out whenever we get invited to talk about the fair, especially the last few years. You know, just because we we've been doing a lot of work out there, and we want people to know what we're doing, and we gather a lot of good ideas. You know, and I always I always tell people it's it's a hokey idea, and most people don't believe us. But actually, some of our best ideas have come from letters we've gotten, emails we've gotten. We monitor social media. Obviously, we have an active social media presence. Comments on Syracuse.com, which are not always that constructive, but some of them are. <laughs> um, Anyway, you know, that, that, that crosses the boundary of how we program the fairs to, to fair to how we use the buildings to the vendors we put into just about everything in between. So it's, al it's always great when we go out and we, we do some of this. Yeah, I came to the fair, as Mr. Kupferman said, about eight years ago. Prior to that, I worked 13 or 14 years for the state legislature. And I used to draft and negotiate legislation, which is, I know, sounds spellbinding in and of itself. <laughs> um, but it, you know, it, so I spent a lot of time in Albany, and then the position came up at the fair, so I came in as an assistant director, and for the last, this will, going into my fifth year as an acting director of the state fair. And you know, it, it's funny, because it, it, everybody does. If you live in central New York, you've certainly heard of the state fair. You've probably gone to the state fair. You probably have very strong opinions as to, at times of how we program the, the, the use of the fair, the balance of the book, or anything else out there. And I always say the state fair is, is like a, a publicly held corporation in central New York, and our annual shareholders meeting is those 13 days at the end of August and the beginning of September when everybody shows up and we get a lot of good feedback from it. And I thought what I'd do is I have a quick PowerPoint, just a little bit of the history of the fair. But before I go into that, just a quick overview of the state fair. We are a, a division of the Department of Agriculture and Markets. Um, we have a budget of about 15 or 16 million dollars, depending on the year. We are operationally self-sufficient, which means the revenue we, we derive pays for everything from my salary to the to the maintenance, the the general maintenance of the fairgrounds, to the action book, to the to the entertainment we bring in, to the to everything in between, as well as. You know, the most popular question you get when you work at the fair is, is it a full-time year-round job? Like, what do you do after the fair? It's a valid question, and, and you know, so we have the, the 13 days of the fair, which which obviously takes a year, it takes over a year of planning for every fair to, to, to get everything in alignment. We also have a non-fair business that we do, the boat shows, the RV shows, the farm shows, and those encompass about 140 different shows in which we use about 650 show days. And it's because we'll book multiple, you know, coming up we have the Veterans Day, the train, um, the train expo and another show. So we'll book, we do multiple shows over the, over the same weekend. But, you know, last year we had, uh, this past fair, we had 1.16 million people come to the fair. And our non-fair business will just about double this year, going from about 600,000 <coughs> to probably just shy of 1.1 or 1.2 million people. You think about that, all those people, now obviously many of them come from central New York, but we also have a significant group, both for the fair and non fair, that we attract people from out of town to come, and that's hotel rooms, that's heads and beds, that's people eating in restaurants and buying gas, and, and, and all the fun stuff in between. And we're, we're actually in the midst of, of, of we're going to begin the process of undergoing an economic um, activity study, but we estimate our, our the total economic activity from the fair and non-fair to probably be in excess of $200 million to the local economy. That adds to the local. Yeah, all the spending for tourists, the, the people coming, the, the, the money we spend. And, and most of, you know, we spend that 15 or $16 million. We are operationally self-sufficient. We do, for lack of a better word, we're a governmental entity. We do turn a profit, but it's really a surplus that then goes into the operation of the fair every year. So that 15 or $16 million in our budget we spend mainly in the local economy by you know on salaries, on buying building products, on, on, on local construction, on, on food and beverage, and everything. So when you add that to, to, together to what everybody else is spending, it's, it's in excess of a $200 million impact on the local economy. But the fair itself, where we've come and where we're going. So the fair, the first fair was held in 1841 on North Salina Street. We were actually the oldest state fair in the nation. There are older county fairs, but we were, we were the very first state fair. And it was meant to be an exposition for, for a multi-day exposition to, to highlight everything that was good in agriculture and the progress being made in the state. It moved among many different cities across upstate New York until 1890 when a hundred acres in Geddes was secured and donated in, in the, and that became the permanent home of the fair. Um, this, in 1899, the, the state took it over from the Agriculture Society, which, which initially started running it. 
and, and from a, the early 1900s through probably the late 30s, early 40s, you know, the fair went through a construction phase, building the Center of Progress building, and, you know, all the beautiful old historic structures you see on the fairgrounds today. They still exist and are still, other than a little technologically outdated, they're still in great condition. They're still <coughs> usable. They're just great old buildings, and the architecture on those buildings, from the Roman columns to the brick faces, are just something you cannot duplicate today. I mean, it is absolutely beautiful. And the Center of Progress building, just an odd fact, it's about overall total building square footage, probably about 80, 85,000 square feet. That building was built in nine months in the early 1900s. If you think about what it takes for construction and design today, that building was put up and finished in nine months. Yeah, and then, you know, in 1928, the Iroquois Village was established, the Ag Museum opened. And actually, during World War II, the fairgrounds did not hold a fair because it was used as a, uh, uh, an area for training and housing soldiers. And you can just, just see how we've increased over the years the number of days of the fair. I lean up, we're at 13, which this was our first year for 13 days, but it's not the longest. The longest was actually 15 days. And, you know, it was, I said all year long, an extra day, you know, what difference does an extra day make, right? We can, for it, but losing 24 hours of preparation at the fair actually became a big deal. I mean, we just you know, we just had people going day and night to get the work done and get the ground settled up. And we all we have a huge influx of vendors who come out of Erie County and the Erie County Fair. And they, they instead of having three days to set up because they'll come out Sunday night overnight, they only had two days to get to get set up and going. But it went off relatively smooth. It was a strong uh, attendance day, and it's something we're going to continue. I don't see us getting back to 15 days anytime soon because there's a whole lot of logistical issues built into that. So from, like I said, we started building in the early 1900s. We, we finished building, you know, major buildings somewhere in the late 30s, early 40s. From that point on, there was no significant investment made in the fairgrounds. It was pretty much, you see what you get. There were permanent restaurants that built or people came in and build them, built them, but no major change at the fair. And you, you think about that, it went for 80 years or six, 60 some years without any major investment. We do get an allocation of funding from the from the governor and the state legislature to put roofs on buildings, so that type of work went on. But it was just it was the same fairgrounds every year. I mean, you could see it in kind of the the stagnation of the attendance. You could see it in the comments made, and I think that's where you know the governor and the county executive came along and they really rallied with us to to get some funding and update the fairgrounds. And you know, I'm sure you all read the paper, so. It became controversial at times because we did take out the historic one mile track, which it, which is over a hundred which was over a century old. But it was a track which, you know, horse racing was no longer viable on it. The Syracuse Mile had moved. We still hosted Dirt Week, which is a great, great event, but it was one weekend out of three uh, you know, out of fifty two weekends. And when we took that track out, we opened up sixty three acres of land that probably most people, unless you went to Dirt Week or you watched horse racing, you never had reason to go on, or you camped because there was a there was a campground there. I mean, when we opened that up, we were able to dynamically change the fairgrounds. Of course, picture of the grandstand being blown up. You know, we were able to open up the the, the 63 acres and, and put in a new midway. We were able to put in a new full service RV park. The RV park we were operating in the infield had a had a plethora of problems that came along with it. And it wasn't even up to health code. So we'd call it temporary RV parking to try to skirt the law. But now we have you know, an entire RV car park that meets code. It has water, sewer, sewer and electric, pop, proper water, sewer, and electric. The, the, the camp sites are wide enough to, 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 have, to host the bigger campers. You know, we, we built the, the Midway, which is a, it's up to, because we added to it probably 16 or 17 acre Midway, which just, what's the significance of the Midway? Obviously, you know, the fair, you think of the Midway. The significance is also financial. We, we take about 44% of every dollar generated by the Midway operator. So when you add that up, we're taking, because he, he, he's done a great job. We switched Midway operators a couple of years ago, and he's come in with new rides. He makes huge investments in his rides, and he put up the, the Skyliner for us. You know, our take on that, when all is said and done, is, is about $2 million, which a adds year. a year. And that's adding everything in, because he pays us for camping, he pays us a lot of other fees, but the, the revenue we receive from the, the Midway is about $2 million in our budget. Um, and it's also doubles as parking during the non-fair. So, so when you go to the Bow show, we, or whatever show, we tend to park cars in that area. Um, we, we were able to widen the streets. We did landscaping. Yeah, the fair 
previous to the investments, it had a lot of very hard edges to it. You know, the concrete and the pavement and the curbing. It was just there was nothing soft or inviting about it. So we added more. We added acres of grass. We've added uh, thousands of new flowers, and all that just makes it a little more park-like and a little more inviting for everybody. So that was year one. So year one, you know result in, in, in 1.12 million people coming to the fairgrounds. We got a lot of good feedback, constructive feedback about how we should change things, add seating, vendors, you know, wanted to be laid out differently. So we took all that and going into the, the second year of the, 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 the revitalization of the fairgrounds, you know, we did, we did a couple of projects. We, we, it was the 100th anniversary of the state police and I, their, their first um, detail was the New York State Police and their first training grounds was actually, actually the Capital League Club in Manlius. Um, so it had, they have a significant tie to Central New York. So we built them a new larger, New York City, a new larger police exhibit with a, with a repelling tower, with a new scuba tank, with a new history exhibit. Um, we also worked with uh, Indian Village to create a new turtle mound, which is where they do their traditional dancing during the fair. And, and it has a significant, significant history in Iroquois uh, beliefs. We opened up the Empire Experience Area, which is actually where those people are sitting. It has a, I believe, about a four-acre pond and a five-acre pond. Um, and it's about a, a, probably has about five acres of grass that, that goes along with it. It's a, it's a great festival grounds. We opened that up. The new Skyliner was built, which is basically the chairlift over the midway. It ran about 1,400 feet. And then we went through and, and we added the shade, you know, we, we, we added more shade. We added literally hundreds and hundreds of new picnic tables and benches and seating areas. We, we really got down to the details of what the, both, the, we laid out vendors differently and, and increased traffic to the west end of the fairgrounds. Um, and, and you'll see later on, but the result of that were, were overwhelming, overwhelmingly positive review, re reviews from fairgoers. We also do a survey with vendors and they were overwhelmingly happy with the changes. And we ended up with 1.16 million people this year. So the year three, we're going into year three. So what are we going to spend money on now? Obviously, you know, with with, uh, with the growth in attendance has come a, a an issue with parking and, and get just getting people to the fairgrounds. You know, parking is not a bad issue to have in life, but sooner or later you have to figure it out. Um, and you know, we we added more park and rides this year. We added more lots this year. We expanded available parking. So the first Sunday of the fair, if you came for the Leonard Skinner and Earth, Wind, and Fire con concerts, I apologize because it was a parking lot for several hours on the highway. I think from that, you know, we, we we improved the communication between DOT and the state police and fair staff and our parking company, and we were able to really flow traffic much easier going into the second second weekend, which is traditionally the bigger weekend. But so when we look ahead to year three, we're going to run, working with our partners at DOT, they're renovating the orange lot, which is our upper lot, and it's the, it's when you have to take the central shuttle to get to the main lot. It's about a 65 acre lot that probably hasn't changed in decades. It's gravel and dirt, and when it rains, we lose 30% of the parking up there because it's just a flood zone of a, in its own way. So the DOT is going to come in and, and spend $27 million putting in drainage, paving, striping, you know, proper lighting. Proper, you know, this, the, every, the safety features a, a parking lot should have. They're going to make it easier for Centro to be able to get around to pick people up and get them down. They're also going to build an on-ramp to 690 westbound. Right now, during the 13 days of the fair, we are the only place in the nation where we're allowed to put up a stoplight on a major inter on any interstate for that matter, but certainly a major state and it's always been an issue with the Federal Highway Administration even and we have an agreement that goes back to I believe 1972 with them that allows that and it, you know, thankfully knock on wood there's never been a major accident there but it is prone to a major accident because you just it's not right to stop traffic on, on an interstate like that but we've done it for years this will this will begin the process of solving that problem phase two of this is actually to build an on ramp to 690 eastbound that way we can get rid of the stoplight altogether, and then traffic will be able to get get out of the orange lot at a much quicker pace and a much more manageable pace, and really a, in a way that makes more sense to the motor for the motorist who's used to getting on on ramps. They're not used to stopping at stoplights on on highways. And also some of this is also off exit seven. We'll putting be putting up a new stoplight just to to catch traffic. 
which will be helpful in just moving traffic, but right now we will dedicate four or five troopers standing in the road to, to manage traffic at those intersections. And once again, thankfully no trooper has ever been hit doing that, but there is a potential when we put them in the road like that that they're gonna get hurt, and that's the last thing we want. So the stoplight will be able to operate remotely and still feed traffic properly. We're also building out for bid right now is a new expo center that'll be built roughly, if you know where the sheep and goat barn are, to the south of that between the, the sheep and goat barn and the midway. It's gonna be 130,000 square feet. It'll be the largest expo center between Boston and Cleveland. The idea is we can use it for the fair and generate significant revenue from it. We can add a, another, <coughs> another building and creature conference and things that, you know, we can do both expositions and use it as vendor space. The bigger prize from this is we'll be able to book a lot more shows during the non-fair. And, and these are shows, you know, the biggest criticism rightfully I get is you're going to compete with the on-center. We have no desire to compete with the on-center. We don't compete with them now. I mean, that's a very clean facility. We're, for lack of a better description, a dirty facility. You know, we like farm shows. We like big equipment shows. We like motocross and we like horse racing. And we'll be able to do all of those things in, in that building. We will have vendors like the farm show who will come in and rent it from us and we'll be able to attract many new shows, you know, from high-end horse shows to, to motocross racing to everything in between. And we're looking at some shows that are currently have a lot of space in the West and in the Midwest, but they don't really have much of a presence in, in, in the Northeast. And some of them are like big rig shows, that type of thing. And they're kind of like these, if you're familiar with the Syracuse Nationals, they're the Syracuse Nationals for tractor trailers, which oddly enough, track thousands and thousands of people and pay a lot of money coming in from out of town. So, you know, we'll be able to, we'll be able to fill this building without a doubt, and it'll help lend itself to continuing the story of the impact that the fairgrounds has on, on central New York in a positive way. And then the plan is that it'll, we'll break ground sometime in December and be finished by August 3rd. Now, like I said, we, you know, we've added more seating, more shade. We added baby carriage cottages this year. You know, it became, actually we received a number of, of comments over the last few years about the lack of breast, breastfeeding facilities for new mothers. It actually, so we took these sheds and created like mini houses out of them where you could go in and breastfeed and change your, your, your child and they, they were a big hit. We, 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 were, we put more money into Chevy Court lineups than we've ever put into to everybody from Peter Noon to to Migos. Um, so we run, we run the, 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 we run all over on what we do. We try to book every genre, every act, every age group we can find. We spend about $1.8 million just on the guarantees for, for those acts on Chevy Corps. That doesn't include our production costs, our sound costs, our staging costs, or anything like that. Um, and you know, this year, we, we took over the Rainbow Milk Bar last year. And, but I don't remember the last time it was actually a rainbow milk bar. I think it was in the late 70s or early 80s when they used to serve strawberry milk. For the 2018 fair, we're actually going through a design process right now to totally remake the rainbow milk bar, reposition it so it makes more sense. Right now, if you know where it is, it's butted up against the, the western door. So one side of it is almost practically useless for us. So you get a huge line on the other side. We're actually gonna take it and reposition it in the building, more, put it more central. And we're going to have at least three flavors available and maybe four flavors. And the fourth flavor, if we can fit it into the budget, will actually just change on a, on a every other day type of basis. So you'll have your basic strawberry, chocolate, and white, and then we'll add cappuccino or mint or eggnog or whatever anybody's fancy is. So it'll truly be a rainbow milk bar again. And then we're actually going through and we're refacing all of these stands in that building. So right now it has kind of this very 1980s-ish lime colored, yellow colored, on it. We're going to reface all of those with like a barn wood and everything and really bring it back to its to its former glory. And you know, what else have we done with the fair? You know, we've, we're spending, it used to be a, a distinctly central New York affair. We're spending a lot of money in the outer markets advertising it, to Rochester, Buffalo, you know, into the border regions of Springfield, Mass, and Scranton, Pennsylvania, into the North Country. And we're doing this with our partners at I Love New York who are committing significant resources themselves to this. And we're seeing the jump in numbers. We're seeing more and more people come from out of town. We're seeing more and more people stay in hotels during the fair. And, and, and that leads us into you know diversifying the lineups on, che on Chevy Corps to make sure we do cover every genre, every age group, every 
every, you know, some people like country, some people like hip hop, some people like classic rock. We try to book them all now. Um, we've done a lot of outreach to minority communities throughout central New York and, 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 and other cities and towns. We've done, we do a lot of events for niche and interests, and we've done a lot of reaching out to, we created an Adopt-A-Family program with, with a lot of our sponsors who reach out to lower income families who, 10 bucks to get into the fair isn't a lot to me, but to many families it's the make or break point of coming to the fair. So we've worked with a lot of our sponsors who have donated money and tickets to, to allow lower income families to come to the fair. And, and it's many great, you know, it's, an, it's the right thing to do and it's a nice thing to do and it, you know, at the end of the day it drives attendance as well. Do you sell attendance? We do. Our, 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 you know, our advertising campaign literally used to be something along the lines of it's $10 at the gate, $6 advance sale, please buy a ticket. And we've taken that and we, we've, we've totally redone a lot of our advertising. We're, it's a more of an emotional advertising, people telling their stories, that sort of thing. But we've also gotten away from, it's, it was really noticeable this year, but you know, we've gotten away from just $10 at the gate. So we do $3 Thursdays, we do a dollar day on each end of the fair. The governor implemented a couple new promotions this year in the middle of the fair. Uh, I don't mean it. I mean, you sell attendance to the vendors that say, look, if you're gonna have 16, 1.6, 1.1, 1.2, million people come in, it behooves you to give us every consideration to come to oh. rent space from us. Oh, oh, absolutely. We figure, you know, our goal is to get people on the fairgrounds and then they spend money. On average, according to our exit surveys, people spend $87 when they're on the fairgrounds, mm -hmm. not including tickets and, and parking. Um, so yeah, we factor, and going back to your point over charging the vendors more, we have been increasing rents, not overwhelmingly, but we have been increasing rents on vendors to be able to pay for some of the gate admission specials we're doing because really the goal is once they're once you get people to the fair they will spend money and that's where everybody so where vendors make money that's and then we get a residual off some of that so it just makes sense that we absolutely do that and we have you know we have we have to a certain extent a right of first refusal for most vendors if you've been there and you've been a good vendor and you've contractually met our terms and you pay us on time you don't give us a huge problem um, we invite you back year after year so you know the Boscos of the world or the you know some, some of the more well-known brands so probably about 90% of our vendors are returning year after year. So it's really 10% of the space we, we give out to new vendors. And we have a waiting list that is several hundred vendors long, especially over the last few years that we've increased attendance and really put a lot more money. There's a lot more interest from not just vendors, but very good vendors to come in. Talking about the vendors, do, do they uh, vet just what kind of vendors they want in? I, I remember guys selling the magnets to cure cancer and other somewhat questionable uh, issues. I, I, I didn't notice them this year. Are they that kind of thing still there? They are, but they might still be there to some extent. We have tried to overturn vendors as well, so, so we get a little less of the, that type of tchotchke type type stuff, <laughs> and, and and a little more of the diversity. When we uh, we've actually gone through and re, redone our policies and procedures, so we actually have policies and procedures now. And part of that is it comes down to new selection, new 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 vendor selection. You know, I think we could all agree we don't need more people selling sausage at the fair. You can go anywhere and buy a sausage sandwich. So we're looking for different kinds of food, different kinds of products, New York products or products at least made in New York or the United States. So we're really trying to diversify and getting away from. I mean, everybody needs a shamong. Don't get me wrong, but we don't need six people selling shamongs. So yeah, we we are trying to move away from that sort of. Um, and then, you know, when we look ahead to what, what, what's going to happen, you know, traffic and parking, you know, we've started meeting right after the end of the fair with the state police and DOT and Centro about how do we provide more parking. Um, and some of it we can get online for the coming year, some of it will be 2019, because you know, the, the other part of this is Honeywell's been doing a huge cleanup throughout, you know, in Onondaga Lake and around around the fairgrounds for some contaminated waste beds, and they actually own a significant number of significant amount of acreage that's been clean that they I don't think they want to be landowners when they leave so you know they they've offered us to, to pave large pieces of land that would facilitate a lot of parking within dis walking, walking distance of the fair although we provide shuttle service as well it would really be parking that gets used 13 days a year but it's probably the highest and best use of that property at this point um, and then uh, you know every year we look how, the original mission of the fair, and it's still the mission of the fair, is to talk about agriculture, have a multi-day exposition 
promoting agriculture. And agriculture has obviously changed since 1841, so it's how do you talk about what agriculture is today versus what people may think agriculture is, because they still have the mindset of the old Vermont barn. Um, so we're always looking to promote New York agriculture in all forms, from dairy to beef cattle to, to grain and forage to horses, which are a huge, huge amount of agri, huge part of agriculture. So we're always redoubling our efforts on how to promote New York agriculture and make it significant, significant part of the fair. And then, you know, it, it's, it's funny, the, 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 the fairgrounds for 13 days becomes a city when you think about it. We, there are days when we will rival the population of the city of Syracuse. And with that comes a full-time fire department that is there for 13 days. The Salt Lake Fire Department brings in trucks. We run a trauma center with the University Hospital on the grounds. We have a police department and the state police. We have emergency responders and ambulance service. And then, you know, we obviously have the same problems as any city or a packed area. And we have a little bit of crime, we have a little bit of this, we have a little bit of that. But, um, you know, part, some of that comes with, with maintaining our infrastructure and, and it's always a challenge on the fairgrounds because so much of the infrastructure was forgotten for so long. But, you know, the, this project has helped us update both, you know, the sewers undergrounds, the cameras overhead, the monitoring of what's going on in the fairgrounds, and, and, and we, we continue down those roads now. But, you know, the result is really, not to say people didn't love the fair again, or look fair before, but the comments we've gotten since, since the renovations have taken place, in part because of the huge amount of space that's available now, the wide aisleways and the seating is, you know, the, we've hit all-time survey highs in being family-friendly, affordable, People are happy with the overall changes, and then Chevy, the quality of Chevy Court. As an aside, Chevy Court attracts about 263,000 people a year to, to sit there and watch concerts. And 93% of the people say they're coming back next year. Um, I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about, you know, one area we, we generally don't talk about that much, but it's something we actually put a significant amount of resources into, and it's given what happened in Las Vegas a few weeks ago and given just the world becoming mad, it seems in and of itself, we do a lot in terms of internal security. We do a lot in terms of emergency planning. When, you know, when I started eight years ago, I think the basic emergency plan was to run in the other direction. We've actually come, come, come through with our partners at the state police and OEM and, 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 and you know, Salt Lake Fire, Rural Metro, all those agencies and, and sat down and come up with, a, and we, we, we do this actually tomorrow's our after action report, but meeting we go through and we put a significant amount of time and resources into what happens if there's an active shooter on the fairgrounds what happens you know if somebody's having a heart attack on the fairgrounds what happens if somebody sets off an m80 and during in the middle of a chevy court concert and how do you react to that it's something like i said we don't talk that much about about it public publicly but we spend i'm not going to say the fairgrounds is 100 percent safe because sitting in this room isn't 100 percent safe but it is something that we spend a lot of time and energy on trying to figure out how do you stop people from using cars as weapons? How do you stop people from bringing a gun onto the fairgrounds? How do you do any of that? In some ways it's, I guess, feel safe when you're on the fairgrounds, but it's all it's probably not the best statement on society that we put that much time and effort into it, but it is needed and it is something we do. And the other thing I'll say in that lines, that the fairgrounds during the fair, we will have about 250 state troopers assigned to the detail probably 175 of them on the ground at any one time. We bring in a dozen members or a dozen and a half members of the Syracuse gang unit. We work with the Onondaga County Sheriff's Department on the buses and on the fairgrounds. It is probably the most patrolled 375 acres in the state of New York per capita during those 13 days. And they do a fantastic job. But I guess I'll take any questions. It's kind of all here. Yes, ma'am. Have you done anything to make it easier for seniors to get around? You know, we've added a lot of ADA ramps that, that didn't used to be on the fairgrounds. We're going through and we're trying to repair, especially when you especially look at Chevy Court, the last couple of years we've torn it up and done, for lack of a better word, half-ass patch, patch jobs on it and that. Um, so we're looking at repaving all those areas and adding kind of more pedestrian walkways. Well, one of the areas, if you take the bus out there, walking over the tracks to get in, has that been done already, something about that? We worked with CF, you know, there's a fine line between what we can do and what CSX will allow us to do in that area, because it's a CSX railroad. So they came in a couple years ago and did some patchwork through there. 
we've worked with them to try to get them to come out and do a better job in terms of bringing it together. And it is hard to get it. My mother, when she used to come to the fair the last few years, would have to be in a wheelchair. And it's hard to get, or if you're just, if you have trouble walking, if you have a baby carriage, if you have a wagon, it's hard to get over those railroad tracks. That's a bigger nut to crack because CSX is just a difficult company to work with. Yes, sir. Um, looking down the road, I mean, you get a lot of projects coming up and things are done, which certainly can be commended for. Down the road, we're five years, ten years out. I mean, I hear rumors out there that the eventual goal here is to be able to contract out things there to some commercial organization. Is, is that got any truth to it? You know, that's always that, that's been talked about my entire eight years at the fair. Is is how do you bring, for lack of a better description, private sector efficiency to it? I don't think you'll ever see the the the, the state fair itself contracted out. To a private entity because it holds a certain amount of, of Americana, it holds a certain amount of, of you want to hold true to the mission of the But you lose control. control. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. And then if you're the governor, you just don't want to lose control of the fair. I mean, it's, it's, so I don't think you'll see that happen. We, you know, we, we are working to bring on a booking company to, which won't be taking over the operation of anything, but the national booking company to help us get some of the shows, some of the national shows to come to the come to the new arena and come to the fairgrounds and, and utilize the fairgrounds on a more active basis. And by the way, I don't mind it if you book uh, Peter Newman every year. Yeah, you know, he is fantastic. He is fantastic. Who's that? Peter. Herman's Hermits. Herman's Hermits. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, there's money in the budget to build the West Chief 690 West. Yep. How soon will the East come? Because if we only exit West, it's a problem. It is for, for 2018, you'll be able to exit west and they'll still be using the stoplight, so they'll still bring you out to be able to exit eastbound. We plan after the 2018 fair is, I think DOT might already have a design done for the eastbound ramp, is to bid it out and have the eastbound ramp built. They also want to build as part of that project, it would be separate from the ramp, but build a, a pedestrian bridge out of the western end of the, 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 the orange lot as well, because right now you have the one that brings you to gate one, basically. They want to build one that'll bring you out to gate four. But the funding hasn't been identified. I think she has a part two. Uh, well, different subject. Are you still working with John Madden regarding the equestrian event? We are, actually. I just had dinner with John Madden on Monday. He, John Madden, for those of you who don't know, his wife is BZ Madden. She's an Olympic equestrian. They own a big farm in Nelson, New York. And he is vice president of the FEI, which is the international sanctioning body for horse shows. And it's actually a big deal when an American gets on it, in part because Europe thinks of, it's very European controlled and they think of us as a new country still. <laughs> <laughs> what would we know about horses? So John is vice president of that, and he actually was having an executive committee meeting at his farm in Nelson. So I went out and had dinner with him. There's representatives there from Switzerland, Belgium, Bahrain, Italy, El Salvador. And you know, one of the things John and I were selling to him, because John used to have the Syracuse Four Horse Invitational, which was a beautiful production in downtown Syracuse for a horse show, but it was just, he couldn't really have it at the fairgrounds because we didn't have the right facility at the time. But it, I mean, it was probably a money loser over and over to do what he was trying to do down there. So, but part of what we were selling to him was, you can bring another horse show like that back to central New York, a world-class equestrian event, and it'll go over well, and the fairgrounds is at a point where we can sustain it now. We have the facilities for, and John's actually been, been instrumental in sizing the size of the new Expo Center to make sure that it can host a major new horse show. So yeah, we're still working with it. There was some mentions a months ago of a monorail being constructed out there. Is that a good investment for the fair and the state of New York? Because to me, it's only something that can be used a few months of the year. But yeah. what's your thoughts on that? Or? Yeah, it was an interesting idea. Um, <laughs> I'd say monorail, maybe, it's, uh, maybe that's not the right it word. It was a cable car, same idea. The cable, yeah. the cable thing, cable car. Gondolia? Yeah. yeah, it's like the Roosevelt Island. Island. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it was an interesting idea. I think it would have become cost prohibitive, and I think the operation and maintenance on it would have been a killer. And, yeah, and I don't think, yeah, it's not a ride. Now, we charge for the thing on the fairgrounds. It's like couldn't charge much more than that for a, for this ride from the orange line. It just would not be a self-sustaining sort of thing. So I think, you know, the cooler heads prevailed and, and you know, we took the money and are putting it into a bigger expo center, which I think the payoff on that is much better than the payoff on a condo system. Of course. Um, 
<laughs> you have to throw a, a prior question uh, about the possible privatization of, of the tariff. The amazing thing about your presentation for me is that um, this is an example of government actually working, and, and it's almost miraculous. <laughs> question relates to uh, this, uh, there had to have been a master plan developed uh, several years ago. You've described what's been done in phases, uh, and uh, uh, that requires leadership. It also requires, uh, is there a team? Who developed the, the, the plan that has been successfully implemented uh, in, within an amazingly short time frame? Uh, if that could be uh, somehow duplicated and spread to other areas of government, <laughs> it would be sort of incredible. Now, part of it has to do with the leadership, uh, I assume. Uh, but it can't be all you. Oh, God, no, Jesus. Um, you know, we have a very dynamic team of 30. Who's here from the CAA? <laughs> <laughs> we have a very dynamic team of people at the Fairgrounds. So we have about 35 full-time permanent employees. We have probably a dozen who five years ago started working on this idea. If we could pitch, a, pitch something to the governor's office and get them to bite on it, what would we want to build? And, and, and you know, we went through this process and, and, and we worked with a local engineering firm who actually donated their services for us to come up with the renderings and everything. Because you know, every good story needs pretty pictures with it. So they, they came up with pretty pictures. And, yeah, we pitched it, and, and some of it changed, and some of it continues to change, which is perfectly fine because it recognizes the market forces, or recognizes what's real and not real. And then, you know, we, we, we engaged deeply with actually the county executive's office and the governor's office, and, and you know, they were very involved in, in hearing our, our, our comments and, and working with us to make it a reality. And I think, you know, the initial 50 million, I figured that's, that would be all we we get, but you know, we continued to push this idea of we can attract, you know, bigger expo center, modern expo center, we can attract more people, and as we attract more people, we need better parking, and you know, it, it was a teamwork environment from the fair to the governor's office to the county executive's office to see Do you all come together. Speak other uh, exhibits, other fairs, other. Uh, if you give me a good I idea, I will steal it tomorrow. Believe me. <laughs> <laughs> I claim. <laughs> That's the way to succeed, to steal an idea. What is it? Imitation is the highest form yeah, of flattery. Sure. So. <laughs> yes, Al. Uh, do you still feel the uh, enthusiasm from the farming community to bring your animals and your exhibits <coughs> to the fair? That's a great question. You know, I think the answer is it depends on the animal you're talking about. I mean, I, we're seeing, honestly, dwindling numbers of cows coming to the fair. Okay. Now, why is that? You know, it used to be, I mean, when the fair started years ago, you, you, I mean, you know, to get a blue ribbon at a state fair really meant something. Now, I mean, you can buy, you can buy the DNA of cows all over the world and, and, and implement it to your cows, and it's, you know, you can test the DNA of cows. So, I mean, dairy farming in and of itself has changed somewhat. And, you know, the, the blue ribbon at the state fair doesn't mean as much unless it's a tradition your family has had. That said, the, the goat numbers, the, the, sh the swine numbers, and the um, poultry numbers are remaining steady. Beef numbers are beef numbers are falling some, and I'm not really sure why. Um, and then horse numbers continue to grow. The number of horse, horse horses participating in the horse shows during the fair, as well as the number of horse shows we host outside of the fair. How do you promote the horse fair? How do you promote the different uh, vending vending? How do you for spread the, the word for the fair and non fair? Well, the non fair, you probably have somebody out there knocking on doors and trying to move these exhibits that are yep. somewhere else to here. Or sure. you've got a package, you got a presentation, you got a PowerPoint, whatever you've got there. But um, you spread the word, you said in other states, you go to country, you, I heard you say Scranton. I heard you say Springfield. Oh yeah, we spend money. We yeah, spend, I think you might have said Erie, I don't know. Yeah, we spend money across the state and into the, the border regions, as well as Canada, uh, the, the, to, to, in, in terms of advertising. How do you measure that? Uh, you know, it's a, it's gotten, you know, print, print we, do, we do no print advertising, or very little print advertising anymore. 
Mm -hmm. We've gone almost entirely, so we do television, we do radio advertising because it's still effective. We don't do print except in specialized publications, and we do almost in everything else entirely digital. So whether it's Facebook ads, Google ads, all of those, and those you can track down to you know, minute detail in terms of it being effective. You know, TV and radio is tougher to track, but it's still trackable. We do a lot of it through exit surveys. Um, and that, that sort of thing to see how effective our advertising is. You know, it gets hard because you know you have to talk about you have 30 seconds, right? So what do you talk about if there's 375 acres? You have you know 10,000 animals on the ground. You have you know 26 Chevy Corp concerts plus 500 other concerts plus all of this. So you have to pick something in 30 seconds you can talk about that'll attract the eye, and that's always the hard part. It's why we've gotten away from a little bit of we do some festival style advertising for Chevy Corp, but we try to get more into the emotional. It's hard to pick out, you know, what's that one thing you talk about? We try to get people on the fairgrounds and then point out to them, you know, we have the six horse hitches going on today, we have Paw Patrol, we have, you know, this concert on Chevy Cord, and we have all these other things. So once we get them there, we, 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 we try to push them out from there. What percentage of people <coughs> that come through the gate go to these individual state sponsored venues? It's different to the people that are just walking around looking for uh, their next sausage sandwich <laughs> and, uh, and the midway. My numbers are rough. I didn't print this part off, but 85% of the people who come to the fairgrounds go to the Dairy Products Building, which is where the Rainbow Milk Bar is. 72%, I believe, go to the Horticulture Building, which actually has like the table setting competition and uh, it has the, some of the horticulture competitions. We actually, the last couple of years, we put a new. Um, agriculture-oriented corner into it, uh, and had well in excess of 80% going to the Center of Progress building to buy their sham wow or, or whatever it is they want to do in there. And the Art Home Center sees a, a lesser percentage. It's quite the fact it's a beautiful building, and that's probably in the mid-50s in terms of percentage where we do like the quilt show, the, the um, cake decorating show. We have a beautiful, I always like to promote, we have a great fine art, arts competition on the second floor of the Art Home Center. Is some of the most beautiful art you'll see in human diameters. It's absolutely phenomenal. Um, so it, it's we, a significant percentage of people actually find their way around the fairgrounds and, and, and do it. And we also do a lot, obviously, through. We don't have an app, but we we got rid of our app. But so we do a lot through um, promotion on our website. Okay. Is the front of the new building? What did you call it? The, the Expo Center. Hmm? The Expo Center. No, the the archer. Yeah, mm -hmm. the archer, the, the maintenance engineer. Oh, no, you. One of your clips was. Uh, that one. The expo center. Yep. Is the front of that going to face the midway or our? Yes, it's going to be a midway thing. Well, it's it's yeah, yeah, you have to pick some part of it that's going to be the front door. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So the way that's set up is it would actually front out going west and then south, which would. Be put you on the area towards the, the midway. And the reason for that is during the non-fair, we will we'll park cars in, the, in what, what is the midway. So you'll keep that going all year? Yep, yep, we'll keep it. And then there's also a natural service road that exists between the sheep barn and what will be the new expo building. So that's why we chose to run in that direction. That's good. Do any of the ride people stay there all year or does everything nope. come down? Uh, everything comes down except for the, the, the new uh, Skyliner. Poles and the cable stay after that, the cars go away. Yeah, so well, they gotta go someplace else, but one of you two, you two fight it up. <laughs> <laughs> when you go to the RV show, let's say, uh, there's all those ancient buses that take you around. Are they in any better state of repair? They're getting in a better state of repair. <laughs> 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 Yeah, if you talk about what we're really poor at doing, it's moving people around the fairgrounds in those old buses. I mean, sooner or later, I've often wanted to contract with Centro to do it because, you know, they have transit buses. This is what they do is they move large numbers of people very quickly to where they want to go, even if it's within a confined area. The problem with Centro is they have what's known as federal charter rules, so they can't compete with a charter company to do it. Um, so we we're trying to work through that because it would make much more sense to put people on those with bus drivers who know how to do this and buses that are handicap accessible and ADA compliant and everything and move them that way. 
Okay. So we're not there yet. That much I can tell you. I have a very specific suggestion, Pat Senator. Mm -hmm. The state fair has always been a very traditional thing. When people go, when they go every year, you know, they just look forward to it. Mm -hmm. There's a certain segment. Um, and, and they're always looking for, well, I want to go back and see what the butter sculpture looks like. You know, that type of thing. Well, <laughs> the uh, Christmas tree of the fall is the purple. Uh, and I often thought that, you know, throughout the Northeast, and this may sound ridiculous, but I'd like to have you think about it, is having some kind of real serious exhibit on the largest pumpkin yeah. in New York State. <laughs> And I'll bet you you'd find a lot of people say, oh boy, I want to see the new pumpkin this year. What's the largest pumpkin? I bet you that would attract a lot of people. Actually, it would. My brother-in-law used to always try to grow pumpkins over a few hundred pounds. You take them to Cooper's, take them out to Farmer's Museum or something, they have them weighed. Um, I agree with you. You know, I never thought about that. You're, you're right. We're going to, we clearly go into fall after the fair. So it's actually, it's a good idea. It's a very good yeah. idea. I, I will work on that. Well, I mean, there's people looking at me and say, well, what are you going to, oh, what do we got to see? The butter store. Okay, we got to see the largest pumpkin. Uh, we got to do certain things, and that's partly why they go. Absolutely, I agree with it. Right. It might be interesting to have a buffalo on exhibit also. <laughs> there's there's a farm out near Kedna, near Chittenango Falls that raises buffalo, and I'm not sure that they can tranquilize one well enough. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be half the, half the fun of watching. <laughs> 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 There's also a couple of on buffalo. Yeah. 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 The Chippewa yeah. yeah. family raised buffaloes. Yes, sir. Would, would it be the political uh, kiss of death if you were uh, appointed permanent director? <laughs> 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 Probably, yeah, that's why I'm happy. They send me a paycheck every two weeks. They call me five back. years? Five, five years. Yeah. Oh. That's always good. Well, that's this is a terrible political appointment. It is a terrible. What is the hang up? What is. Mm -hmm. It's dead on. Yeah. Everything is politics. Even in the bedroom is politics. <laughs> 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 Look at guys. I mean, it's a. It's an underlying question that people don't want to ask, and they say to all of us say to ourselves, "What's going on here? What's the hangup?" You know, it's my standard answer is I'm perfect, and you know, my job is to okay. produce the <laughs> okay. And half my family thinks I'm an idiot for keep go to keep going through this. The other half just figures I'm, I've gone insane. So. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. And then you do it. Okay. Um, your, your newest venue that replaced the, the paid entertainment that was <coughs> used to be on the ground, so they've now taken that out. It's not, um, I understand it's not that easy for seniors, the, even if you, like, you drive as close as you can get, there's quite a distance to walk and so on. And also, um, the entertainers have been sort of, I would try to risk it anyway, but none of the entertainers like you, me, and they're more for younger people, most of them. Yep. But anyway, will that change? And I would love to be able to go to that, but I just am a little fearful of what, what it entails. You know, it's, it's, it's an odd thing there because the county actually operates it, so we provide any support we can for them. Um, I think the paving of the orange lot will allow people to park even closer to, to, to the venue. But you're right, it's still, once you park there, and if you're seated in the, the, the covered section, it's a walk, and it's a walk down a hill, and yeah. it'll back up the hill when you're coming out. County has started instituting golf carts. So if you're parked in the ADA section, they will, they, they, they will oh, take you, which is very nice. I get excited when I see the golf cart. So it's like I went to Glimmer Glass, yep. just takes you right out over to golf carts. Yeah. And I think it's great for seniors, you know. And as an aside with golf no carts, dur enough. during the fair, we do have courtesy cars available. So if you find yourself on mm -hmm. you know, the, the Western Netherland or the fairgrounds and you need to get back east, if you stop a member for security, and also of the new acts, I, mean, I went to the trampoline act and the high wire act. Oh. I love the new acts. I especially mm -hmm. love the trampoline. What was the most popular of the new new acts this year? You, you know, it's, it's funny. It, we, we did a Facebook poll, and it's, it's unreliable as it sounds, so take this for what it's worth. Um, Hilby, if you know who Hilby is, he's this 
Yeah, he's funny over here. He is. He, 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 he's funny and degrading, but you laugh at him. And um, he's always the most popular in terms of what people talk yeah. about. But he's also been there forever, and he's only there, I think, for six. He does the Dutchess County Fair for the first six days of our fair, and then he comes up and finishes with our fair. Um, everybody loved it. I don't know if there's a clear distinction between the, the, high, the high wire act, the high dive, and the, the trampoline show. Which one was the favorite? People seem to love, love them all. Actually, I went to see the circus for the first time this year. And I gotta say, it was actually a pretty circus, too. Oh, it's it's more of a Cirque du Soleil when you get into it. I mean, they have camels, which is the only animals that yeah, can in the circus. Everything else is high wire and wooden and things. The trampoline act was amazing. Yeah, it was, it was fantastic. It's a gentleman we started going back there. There's an annual convention <coughs> there to tell in Las Vegas, and we've never been able to go because they didn't want to send us to Las Vegas, but they finally sent us. And that's actually where we found a lot of these great shows. They come there and they, they, yeah, they obviously are willing to be booked and filled, filled 52 weeks a year. So this gentleman is actually out of Montreal and he runs just a phenomenal, phenomenal job. Yes, sir. Yeah, you've done a great job. The, uh, the Chevy Court area is very spacious. Yes. It's a much different feeling when you're there. Uh, going out towards the Midway, everything feels really spacious. And yes. Uh, I don't feel as cramped and crowded and let me get out of here feeling. Um, last year, I used your app a lot and it was great. It, it worked really well. I think you changed companies this year with the app yep. and it wasn't as versatile. Um, but I really think it's a good idea and a good tool to use for, you know, for your own personal you scheduling. You measure the hits on the, when somebody accesses your uh, website, your app? Yeah, 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 we keep data and analytics on it and everything. It, it was hard, you know, it's hard because it's, we, we, we didn't program the app as much as we could have and we went more to a slimmed down mobile website that basically looked like an app, but it wasn't an app. And part of the reason for that is to keep up that app, it's about $20,000 a year just, just to keep it up and put the information into it. So you, that's why we went to more of a slimmed down mobile app to try to accomplish the same thing. But I haven't looked at the numbers to know if one was more popular than the other. It's very yeah. difficult to maintain a, a website. It's expensive <laughs> and there's always new, but new technical aspects to it. So it's understandable, Absolutely. And especially on a moving part yeah. that you guys have. Yeah. I mean, programming the schedule in, into, the, to, into our app or our state fair websites just First of all, it's, it's almost impossible to get 100% right because schedules keep changing. And yeah, you, know, you look at horse shows, and you know, a horse show will run till it finishes, so it's even tough to put start and finish times. And we have horse shows that will run to three in the morning just to go through classes and everything. Hmm. Yeah, well, that, that's a good point. About but I mean, it was great for scheduling. Absolutely. You know, make, Taylor, make your own schedule, and then you had everything right there. What am I doing next? You know, and so I mean, I think it's a great tool, and I know a lot of people. Any other questions? Well, you didn't do a fair job. You did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> There's what you say. It's better than a fair job. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that should be your motto. That's right. Your tagline. <laughs> well, thank you very much for uh, for listening.